ahead and get started by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Darlene Mahoney. I am with SeniorLivingGuide.com, and I am the National Digital Sales Director and the podcast host of SeniorLivingGuide.com podcast, which is a senior and caregiver resource podcast that is available anywhere you listen to music or podcasts. We have, uh, I think, 57 episodes um, of, of various different topics, um, all kinds of things that you can look at, see what the podcast topic is, and see if it's a good fit for you. So take a listen um, and see if it's something that you like and enjoy. Um, and then we also have seniorlivingguide.com, which is a national reach website that provides seniors and their caregivers with a one-stop shop into finding senior housing solutions, home care solutions, and even senior resources. Um, it's a great resource um, for them. And it's also a great opportunity for advertisers to um, receive leads. Um, it's low flat monthly pricing um, because we are not a placement agency and we don't charge referral fees. So that's a great opportunity for you as an advertiser. And then we also have print publications in Florida, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia, hospital directories, and all kinds of different things. So if um, reaching seniors in their families is something that is important to you, please feel free to reach out to me. I can give you some more information um, on the, uh, the offerings that SeniorLivingGuide.com provides. And with all that being said, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Carla and Stephanie. They are with Huntington Behavioral Health. Um, I have worked with them in the past. They did a webinar, I mean a podcast. I'm doing my webinars and my podcast, getting all confused here. Um, they did a podcast with me um, about general wellness. Would that really had some great uh, uh, eye-opening things, even for me in my own daily life that I had never thought about. And it's just taking baby steps into that overall wellness in your life. And so that was really great. Um, so I'm really excited to have you on the webinar. So please feel free to give me a little information about yourself and we'll get started. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Darlene. And thank you, everybody that's joining us from all places. This is so wonderful. Um, uh, here's my colleague and friend, Stephanie Witt, and we are with Huntington Behavioral Health. What we do is we bring psychology and psychiatry to uh, the, living, the senior living space, to uh, skilled nursing facilities, assisted living facilities, memory cares, and now recently independent living facilities. So that's what we do. I'm a consultant for both the clinical part and the business development for Huntington. And Stephanie is our Director of Clinical Operations. Welcome everyone, thanks for joining us, especially in Nebraska, go Big Red, I'm originally from there. Um, uh, so I, I started out uh, really as a CNA. Um, for that, I was I grew up with my grandma and my great grandma and cared for them. So um, from there, I became a nursing home administrator and when I moved to Florida, I became the Director of Clinical Operations for Huntington So what we're going to be doing today is we are going to be learning about uh, burnout, right? We're going to be describing what burnout is because sometimes we, we hear the word, right? And we're not sure what it might be. So I'm a clinical psychologist, so I'm going to be bringing that clinical part. We're going to learn how it's diagnosed. We're going to learn what the main characteristics of burnout are. We're going to describe it and also differentiate it from stress and regular anxiety or stress. And we're also going to identify what are the signs of burnout. Like, do we see it in ourselves? Do we see it in our teens? Do we see it in the people that we live with and share a life? We're also going to apply some strategies to address it, both for yourself and your team. And because Stephanie is here with her experience, we're also going to talk about mental health empowerment and strategies for you to bring over to your organizations. And in order for you to handle either burnout or any other mental health issues that might be coming in, in, in our workspace. And as you were mentioning, Darlene, we all need it. We all experience some stress and these have been tough times since the pandemic and on, uh, particularly for our space and senior living. It has been tough and uh, we do have some areas in which we can all benefit from what we're gonna talk about and share today. Just like Darlene said, you have a chat box, uh, you have a Q&A box, let us know. Darlene is going to be checking it. And actually, we are leaving some time at the end so that we can address your questions. That being said, let's get going. So uh, how often do we feel like this? How often do we feel emotionally or physically exhausted? If I were in the room, I would be having you raise your hands. Some of you can raise your hands in the chat. How many of you feel emotionally, physically exhausted after work? Okay. How many of you feel weak, sometimes susceptible to illness at times, right? Because we've been working so hard, we're stressed out. 
Um, how many of you feel worn out at the end of the day? We're, you know, happy hour time, you know, right? <laughs> We're all raising our hands. And how about feeling drained from constant work with your clients, the residents, those people that you really want to care for, right? Even your family, you feel a little bit drained. So just wanted to ask you this because these questions actually come from the personal work-related and client-related signs of burnout uh, inventory. So what this means is that if you have answered yes to any of your questions, you do have some indications that you might be experiencing burnout. As we're going to learn, not everybody is experiencing burnout, but if you're finding yourself experiencing some of these, you might be at risk of developing. And that's what we want to share with you today. So uh, let's start with the basics, right? Let's start with the definitions. What is burnout? So I brought you two definitions here. The first one uh, is really interesting. It says a state of physically, physical, emotional, and mental exhaustion caused by long-term involvement in emotionally demanding situations. So it's funny because most of us will experience burnout at work, right? So we, as we know, we're human beings. We cannot separate our emotions from what we do. So when we experience burnout, we're actually having an emotional response to the stressors that we've been into. The second definition that I want to bring about is actually by the psychologist that developed the concept of burnout for the first time, and that is Herbert Freudenberger. So he says it's a state of fatigue or frustration brought about by devotion to a cost, a way of life, or relationship that failed to produce the expected reward. As you can see, guys, we're going deep here. We're going emotionally deep. So uh, in the beginning of my presentation, I had an image. Let me see if I can go back to the here. Uh, this image, and I want to share it. You see those matches? You see those matches? Not all of them are uh, actually on fire, right? We have one that has been on fire and is now kind of extinguished and it's burned out. The reason that is, is because not everybody experiences burnout because people that give 100% when they work, people who give their all, people who are emotionally invested in what they do, those are the people that experience burnout. So that image says a lot about who in your team, who maybe yourself, you give 100% of what you do, you're, you're the first one in the office, you're always invested in what you do, you love what you do, you are most at risk of developing burnout versus somebody that just goes there and like, okay, I'll do what I can, you know. <laughs> so I'm gonna move real quickly here to where we were at. Okay, so there, there's, there's my image again. All right, so is it burnout? Now, one thing we gotta know is that exhaustion uh, can be uh, overcome by rest, right? Uh, anxiety, uh, stress, you take vacation, you feel bad. Now, anybody can become exhausted, but when you're highly committed is when you can only burn out, and only if you have been alive in the first place is when you can experience it. So the origins and the current state, just like I mentioned earlier, it's important to know who, how did it all start, right? What well, basically this psychologist, Herbert Freudenberger, were studying doctors that were actually involved in taking care of um, hospitalized um, troops after World War II. That's how he started uh, actually his research, and they were identifying, they were the ones who coined the term. They were the ones who told him, we feel burned out by what we're doing. So and they were medical professionals, but at this point we know, and it has later evolved into any working professional that's experiencing exhaustion and inability to cope with the daily, daily task of your job can be experiencing this. Now, in, very interesting, in 2019, the World Health Organization actually clarified and classified burnout as a syndrome. So what that means is that you can actually be diagnosed by it. Now, it's not an illness because an illness, you know, to differentiate from a syndrome, an illness is something that we know something is wrong in your body and it's causing you to have an issue. So, so it is an illness. Uh, syndrome is something that is actually coming from the outside and something we might not be sure exactly what is causing it. So that's how you differentiate syndrome from illness, but it is a syndrome. So that means that you can be diagnosed with it and you can have some symptoms from it. So uh, also, as we know, during COVID-19, it has magnified burnout. You know, all of our industry has been hit hard during the pandemic. So uh, some of the data that I gather to prepare this information, actually uh, indeed.com where you go and find jobs, they actually surveyed 1,500 uh, workers across various industries, industries, and they actually found that nearly 10%, which was 52% in 21 compared to 43% before the pandemic, actually met criteria for burnout. So this is 
something we got to pay attention to. I'm so glad we have, at this point, over 90 people are checking in here, are trying to learn more. So what are the causes of burnout? Now, I this is kind of like a, a number of them. And I'm sure as you go over them, we are, we're, we're, you're going to identify some of these. You might be experiencing some of these areas. Like, for example, lack of autonomy. And this is when you're at work, right? And you don't have full control over the decisions that you can make, right? Uh, lack of control over your work. You never have enough time to finish those tasks and projects. You always have things on your to-do list. It keeps growing. You never feel like you're getting ahead. Mismatch values, maybe between you and the organization that you serve, maybe between you and the people that are above you where, where you're trying to do your best, but there's some mismatching values. Having a clear uh, work or job expectations, you truly can hit that mark because you don't even know what the mark is sometimes. Uh, working in a dysfunctional team or organization. Now, the next one I have all caps because we're all experiencing right now in senior living understaffing. Um, that's a big one. Job requires a heavy workload, you know, maybe many hours or a lot of stress and uh, tasks during your day. Having little or no support from your boss organization. Uh, no recognition for your work. That's a big one, right? Uh, we all focus on what's wrong and how to fix it, but there's not enough recognition of what we are doing right. And uh, just on the same uh, on the same uh, length there, a job well done is not rewarded. So these are some of the causes of burnout. Now, uh, it is a cycle, and I wanted to make sure that I brought this example that I took from the nursing environments. You know, you have uh, job dissatisfaction leading to burnout, leading to nurses turning over, going to different jobs, going to work for agency, for example, which means we now have a nursing Shortage. So now this brings us to the understaffing, the problem that we have, which leads to more job dissatisfaction, burnout, et cetera, right? So we know that we, we're kind of stuck in the cycle there. So uh, let's do something real cool here uh, that I wanted to share. This is uh, when we get trained as psychologists, we always train how to diagnose something and how to differentiate it to what the thing that's closest to it so that we know, right? So what we're going to do now is we're going to learn about stress and burnout, and we're going to learn how each of them are different. So the main thing here would be to see stress, imagine stress as too much, too much energy, too much things to do, too much energy, and then burnout will be not enough. Now let's let's look a little bit into it. Uh, stress would be too many pressures that demand too much of you physically and psychologically. You just feel like you it's never enough. Stress people will imagine that if you just get everything under control, you'll feel better. Or if I take that vacay, I'm going to feel better. Let me just get a few more days to work early in the office and I'll get it done. Now, you're usually aware of the state. Most of the time we tell people, oh, my gosh, I'm so stressed out, right? I feel stressed out. We tend to be a little bit more in tune with that um, status in our body. Also, over a long period of time, uh, stress and anxiety will have a physical cost, right? You'll start having tense shoulders, you need a massage, you maybe you're having tension headaches, maybe you even need if, if you have it for many years, you might develop a cardiac condition, etc. Uh, now let's on the other side, let's look at burnout. Burnout is not enough. And what I mean by this is the person experiencing burnout is going to feel like they're empty. There's no more motivation. I used to care for this job, but now I'm beyond that. I'm just like disconnected. Uh, I don't see any hope for the future. Uh, I don't think things are going to change. And you're, they, you might see yourself or other people just going through the motions. They don't seem like themselves. You don't always notice burnout. So that's another thing. That's what we're all learning here. So we can identify it in us and other people. Uh, the person doesn't have that much insight that they're at that place. And over time, it can lead to cynicism, exhaustion, poor performance versus where you were before. And definitely, we are going to look into it. It might also start looking like depression. So the psychological presentations of stress versus burnout, when you're in a stress in a stressful environment or you feel stressed out, you're going to be more reactive. You're going to be like looking at what's coming at you and trying to respond to it real quickly. Uh, you're going to have this sense of hyperactivity, of urgency. I got to get it done. Maybe you do have loss of energy at the end of the day, right? Kind of those questions at the beginning of the webinar. It, it might lead to an anxiety disorder. You might start having like generalized anxiety disorder where you're like, your, your mind is painted the worst case scenario picture for you, or maybe panic, you start having some panic attacks. And primarily the costs are physical if you don't take care of this. Now, if you're on the burnout side of things, your emotions are gonna be a little bit blunted. You're just gonna be like, 
a little flattened even where, where you're just not hearing a lot and you feel helpless and hopeless. But this is how it starts looking like major depressive disorder, like serious depression. Loss, loss of motivation, loss of your ideals, there's no more hope, uh, detached, depressed. And primarily at this point, the cause will be emotional because we, we are, we're moving inwards into what that state of burnout is doing for us. And as, you, as we know, during the pandemic also, there were some, um, there was some news, right, of doctors, for example, that committed suicide. And I know it's, a, it's deep and it's tough, but basically this is where you go from being stressed out. We're taking care of the pandemic. We're taking care of my patients to like, I just, I have no hope and I might even do something to hurt myself. So this is serious. Now, um, I wanted to talk about the physical, the behavioral, and the emotional, because as we know, we are complex human beings. And when you have these three, it's actually very difficult for you to realize that maybe that you have it. Also, this is the key to getting better. Because if you're having some physical symptoms or some behavioral symptoms, and let's say you work on helping yourself identify the emotions or even changing some behaviors, you will create some change and you will be able to feel better. And this is what basically what we do in psychology with cognitive behavioral therapy. We teach how behaviors, emotions, and um, your thoughts are all related and correlated. And basically, if you work, if you work on it, eat any of them, you can bring change to that equation. So how does it look in terms of behaviors? I think we got a clearer picture now of what uh, burnout is. You're gonna be isolated. Maybe you're not performing your responsibilities. Maybe that work-related anger outburst, maybe that person seems irritable all of a sudden. They don't seem like themselves physically. They will feel tired. Maybe they might have some difficulty sleeping. They might have changes in appetite and frequent headaches, muscle pains, or maybe they're just not feeling like themselves. And emotionally, lack of motivation, maybe some self-doubt, maybe did I make the right choice? Am I in the right career? Um, failure, loneliness, and an overall feeling of dissatisfaction. So if you are with me all the way till here, um, the three main symptoms of burnout, the way I know as a psychologist that it is burnout and it is nothing else, is that the person is gonna feel one, exhausted. Two, depersonalization. What that means is basically if you had a certain personality, a certain way of being, you're just not yourself. You don't feel like that. People don't see you like you used to be before. And then you feel like there's no personal accomplishment. You know, like you're questioning your choices at this point. Did, did I choose right? Should I go into another job? Should I quit? Uh, so those are the three main symptoms of burnout. And that is how a psychologist, we know that this is what we're encountering. This is usually the questions will go underneath to see what's behind all these three. And then how can we bring change? So now that we know what it is, this is where my colleague Stephanie is going to help you address it. And what we're going to do is we're going to go into three main strategies here, Darlene. We are going to go into what we can do personally, right? Five strategies to bring balance to our lives after, after this webinar. We're all going to have three, five things we can go ahead and do today. We're also going to learn how to help our team. If we have people in our team that are experiencing burnout, we're going to talk about burnout in the workplace. And finally, we're going to talk about the organizations that we belong to, the corporations, as much as we can be an element of change for them and a catalyst for change. We're also going to learn about how to be more mindful of mental health issues in the workplace. And finally, we're going to share some very important resources that are all free and that we're going to be sharing with you so that you can move forward knowing how to help others if they're experiencing burnout. Uh, so this is Sophia's Carla. So I'm going to help Carla out now. Um, talk about the five. Stephanie, yeah. scoot a little closer because you're breaking up a little bit. I think you're a little far from the microphone. All right. Good. All right. Yeah. Sophia's Carla. Yeah, Sophia's Carla here. Um, she needs some. She needs to know the five strategies um, to uh, bring talent. So one is to figure out: Are you working with purpose? Um, so we'll talk about that here in a minute. Um, do you feel like you that your career has a deeper purpose other than just being a patient? So if you're sitting in that parking lot or you're about ready to log into that computer and you're dreading that, it's probably earning a page. Uh, so we really need to talk about what was your purpose? Why did you sign up in the first place? Um, and we'll, we'll go into a little bit more detail. But rediscovering your purchase or your purpose, rediscovering your purchase, I know what's on my mind. Um, so rediscovering your purpose can go a long way towards helping you avoid burnout and keeping the stress at bay. So really finding your mojo again. 
Um, so asking yourself, how does your work make life better for other people? I know for most of us, we are here for a reason. Um, we started out because we wanna help people. We care about people. We have passion um, to help others. So where are you at with that? And how can we get there again? And how could you add more meaning to what you do every single day? Um, and that's really about, you know, that mindset is when you first wake up. What is your meaning? What is your purpose? And where do we get, where do we go? What is your steps to get there? And if you think that you're in the wrong role or career, develop a career strategy that will help you plan for a career that's better for you. I want to, uh, I want to reiterate over and over again to you, this is not a presentation for you to go quit your job, okay? What we're trying to do is find ways so you don't quit your job and you find uh, your mojo again. So let's look at the five strategies to bring balance back into your workplace. Uh, the other is, it, the second is to perform a job analysis. Uh, this is, you know, this is pretty deep. It's, you have to dig deep. Because I think a lot of times when we start thinking about job analysis, we can very quickly, especially if you're stressed or burned out, it's almost like, why? Why am I doing this? Um, you've already hit the brick wall. It's it's like you feel helpless already and you don't wanna think about it any, but you almost make excuses of not to, um, to, to do a work analysis. So really get through that mindset and know that on, on the other side of this, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. So when you experience a work overload, overload day in and day out, you can start to feel as if you're on that treadmill. Or um, and I've had where I, I reference a roller coaster ride: <laughs> really highs, really lows, really fast, really slow. Um, and that, and then you feel like you'll never catch up. So this is really demoralizing. It's stressful, and it can lead to that work burnout. But you need to clarify what is expected of you and what isn't. Uh, there are days when I talk to my good friend Carla here, she has to-do lists uh, galore. Um, and sometimes we talk about the to-don't list as well. And, and what have we done to assign tasks uh, to ourselves that don't need to be done? Or is it something, we've always done it so we need to continue to do it. But what is expected of you and what isn't it needs to be clearly defined. And uh, we'll get more into when you go and have some discussions with with your, your teammates, your boss, your organization um, uh, to go into this. But then you also need to identify what's truly important in your role and then cut out or delegate tasks that aren't essential. You look at, the, look at your team and look at their strengths, look at their passions. Some people enjoy things more than others. So there are certain things uh, that I'm like, Carla, you know, she loves, she loves um, the creativity and writing up um, the, the emails that we do and all that stuff. And I love reading them. I love giving her um, excitement about the topics. But at the end of the day, she's amazing at it. And she, uh, she does a great job of it. And she loves doing it. But then, so that's a delegate, um, a delegate good time. So that's what I always call it. Um, I sing a little song sometimes, delegate good time. But uh, there are other things that we just need to cut out. So think about those as well. What is just spinning your wheels? And it, is it necessary? But if you feel that your boss is assigning you more work than you can handle, then schedule a private meeting to discuss the issue. Let them know that your excessive workload is leading to burnout, um, but come prepared with solutions. Come prepared with options uh, that can be considered to shifting the certain task or projects to someone else. Uh, really come with, you know, the the whys and um, and letting them know this is why I'm suggesting this. And also I have a solution for the for the problem. Nothing more than going. It's it's worse if you go in and you're just having a gripe session. But if you have solutions, they're also having aha moments. They want you to succeed. That's why you're on the team. Uh, also, it's taking control. So you can avoid or, or overcome burnout by finding ways to create more autonomy in your role. You need to talk to your boss if they're willing to, to, to listen. And, and let me be clear, there are times that your boss is maybe the mid-level. They didn't make the decisions. They're kind of the bearer of bad news. Uh, so, you know, don't, uh, don't shoot the messenger all the time. But you do need to start brainstorming with the boss. Uh, they're talking to other people that are decision makers that are pushing these agendas. And it's really important to get to the bottom of, of you know, who these people are, why, what is the mission, vision, values of the company? What's the mission, vision, values of yourself? Um, does they match your, your tasks, the projects, the deadlines that you're given? 
And, you know, ultimately, do you, do you take your boss with you to get to that next level and have those, those deeper discussions? Um, and I'll tell you, it makes a difference. If they know who you are, it's no longer just a, a name or a number. Um, they know who you are, they know your passion, they see your heart, and they know, you know, you're here to care about people. And you have some really great solutions to how to get that done. Um, you'll also feel more in control. Hopefully you do feel heard and, um, and it gives you an opportunity so that you can manage your tasks or your, your time more effectively. You do have to prioritize. So we, in healthcare, we call it triaging, right? So we do make our to-do lists. Don't forget those to don't list. Make sure those, uh, those are, are, are there as well. Um, make your action plan and take control of your, your daily life. Um, and, but you're also thinking about your daily, your weekly, your monthly and your yearly, yearly personal goals. This is important because yes, everything, yeah, we revolve our, our world around work sometimes, but to, to gain that passion, to keep that passion, you really do need to focus on personally why you're doing those things as well. Um, we're all here, I think, because we do give to others. So one quick and easy way to add meaning to your career is to give to others and help them in very small ways. I know uh, I was a CNA. It was really important that we had certain tasks. You know, there were certain things that we had to do um, every hour, in your meal times, every other hour, um, just in, you know, going to the restroom. That's such a dignity thing um, that I, I made it more of, it wasn't a task for me. It was how I'm going to make a person feel. And um, let them experience a, a special moment, try to put a smile on their face. Don't even um, have them think that that's, you know, that it's an issue or, or a task um, that we're helping them go to the restroom. But how did we make them feel in that moment? And it could change their mindset even for the rest of the day without, you know, giving them that dignity back and giving them a special moment that um, they can feel good about. But even the smallest acts of kindness can re-energize -ener yourself as well and help you find um, the meaning back in your work. So I really, uh, you know, when people say, oh, I, I can't believe you were a CNA, I can't, that was one of my favorite jobs in the world um, because it did, um, you know, it did re-energize me. When I could give somebody a, a smile on their face, a family member, I would still get Christmas cards um, from family members that said, you made such a difference in, in my loved one's life there at the near end. So you find your meaning and, and you stick with it. Um, learn to manage stress. When you're not managing your stress well, it should be, it could be short-term stress, right? Uh, Carla and I had quite the morning already. We we're getting ready for another conference, and we had to go get our collateral. We had to get in the storage unit. We were um, we were stressed. So, you know, the the guys with the keys they weren't there in time. Um, but we couldn't let it get to us. You know, we started, you know, we, we made the best of it. We um, worked with the team. Uh, we, they were motivated as soon as they got there as well. We'd never met them before, but we're like, hey, this is what we got to do. Uh, we still made it a good experience. We all had a good time laughing. It could have turned into a really bad situation very quickly. And that's not what we meant, or that's not what we let happen. So um, we did not contribute to burnout today. Um, but developing a self-care routine is, is a good strategy to learn how to manage stress effectively. So I think, you know, when I woke up this morning and, and you know, we had planned, we've been planning this, but, you know, um, just to know that we already had our plan in place, we'd already talking about, uh, we had taken the steps necessary to make it happen this morning, um, getting the U-Haul, all the things that, that needed to happen, we did it. And, um, knowing that we had a purpose behind it, it wasn't stressful, and we knew how to manage it effectively uh, before we ever started our day. So having a plan is really important. Those to-do lists made it so that we didn't have really short-term stress, long-term stress, or burnout. Practicing the deep breathing, the meditation, and other relaxation techniques can help you um, when you're experiencing stress. I will tell you, this is not my cup of tea, um, but I think Carla, yeah, yeah. I, love, I love meditating. I love meditation. It has done wonders for me. I, I have no issue in admitting it. I have issues with anxiety, which we know turns to stress, and stress is uh, a, a particular area that can turn into burnout. So I meditate as much as I can weekly and just want to share with the team and the group here that it did help me. I started very, very badly. It would I would do two minutes and I was like opening my eyes, looking around like this is not working, but I stayed with it. And I actually picked it up during the pandemic because it was a lot of stress. 
providing care at the facilities and I was still working as the in residence. Um, so I started with an app. I downloaded an app and it took two minutes of my day and I just get at it. At this point, I can meditate for 30 minutes up to an hour sometimes. It's wonderful. And actually there's research that proves that Meditation changes the brain, changes the brain in a positive way where you have more focus, more attention, and you're teaching your brain of how to actually focus for a longer period of time and also disconnect from that constant voice in your head that's telling you, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to worry about this, you got to worry about that, because you're going back inside. And instead of going out there and being very reactive to what's around you, you're actually go coming back to yourself. Now, does it take an hour? No, because you can see the benefits in a few minutes a day. So take a few times, look it up online, uh, mindfulness meditation, download the app, even your watch just nowadays remind you to have a mindful moment. That's all you need and just get, get better at it, like anything with the brain. My cup of tea is, is exercise. Uh, so I, I, a lot of times I'm listening to podcasts as I'm walking. Um, and so, and then also I, 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 if I'm not walking outside, which I love doing, it's hot in here in Florida. Um, and so if I'm not doing that, I do need to go to the gym. Uh, but I also, I will say that I do sleep better at night because of um, the times that I, of when I exercise, oh, I do sleep better. Mm -hmm. Um. Some people don't like to wake up early. I'm not one of those that do like to wake up early. I fit it in, in another part of my day. Um, but I will say exercising at lunchtime, taking your bestie, going on a walk, uh, your work bestie, or just going by yourself, decompressing, um, not thinking about anything about work, get some fresh air. Uh, if, if you can do that, 15 minutes makes a difference. Don't let yourself get wound up. Uh, it, you need those minutes. And sometimes just going and and letting your, your boss know, I'm not, you know, it's not a bathroom break. Uh, I need a me break for, you know, 10 and, uh, and go get it. So you, um, it, there are times that we've done fitness challenges, not weight loss challenges. Weight loss challenges are, are, I, I they're not fair for people because not everybody's built equally. Right. Um, but I will say that, it, that a fitness challenge and just getting out there and being more active that's fair for everyone. Everyone, if we can dedicate a little bit of time for that, it makes a world of difference. It makes everybody feel better. And everybody's motivating and cheerleading each other one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, okay, preventing burnout in your organization. So you need to set clear and consistent goals for your team. They are not mind readers and they need to know what's going on. Um, sometimes setting those goals also needs to lead to training. And also every year we get, you know, certain trainings over and over again, but pr provide frequent training uh, to increase the role effectiveness, conflict resolution, coping mechanisms, and uh, also consultations, the um, um, consultations to staff are experiencing job, job stress, uh, your support, encourage the development of the support groups and resource exchange networks, and maximize staff autonomy and participation in decision making, so empowering people. So what can your organization do? One, um, the Mental Health American identified six most common policy and program changes er in areas that have proven if effective based on employee direct feedback. It is important to be heard. Uh, I think that's the, the, some people shy away from this, but it's really important. Um, if you know you've been heard and, and things don't change, then you gave it your best shot. You didn't just give it away. You didn't just quit. So one is to increase the access to the mental health benefits and resources. This is huge for your um, organizations to, to provide. A lot of times it's the employee uh, assistance programs. Usually they're posted right there um, in your comment or you're in your break rooms and things. It's important even text reminders so that they know where the link is of where to call on a consistent basis. Um, it's it's difficult and it's embarrassing sometimes for your team to ask. So making a, a friendly reminder, a constant reminder, and having it easily accessible is, is really important. Uh, it should cover some mental health services, um, and it it will help reduce the mental health physical uh, visit copays that, that you might have. Um, and then implement the telehealth mental health services. I will tell you, the last thing a person wants to do after work, they're working so very hard is to get out of bed again to tell somebody, man, I don't feel good. So if there's an opportunity to stay in your pajamas and have that talk with somebody on the screen, 
um, please get that service, get the mental health services through telehealth if you can. Um, evaluate the compensation and role structures. I don't care how many times you tell somebody don't talk about your pay. Um, it, it's, it's not the best kept secret. So they will talk about it and um, they will know if they are getting paid fairly. Um, you know, those times where you're, you're hiring someone new and you're giving them uh, sign on bonuses, but then you're not compensating the people that have been there for the longest uh, um, with tenure. You really need to think about that strategy. If you're, you know, the new sign on bonuses I get, but also those bonuses for being there for so many years is important as well. So um, think about that and, and making sure that it's fair. So performance based compensation and bonuses is also important. Um, what I have found is sometimes companies uh, or supervisors, they might kind of abuse this, right? Where they still have to meet budget. Um, sometimes I've seen it where they think that the best strategy is then to, to almost, instead of a five out of five, they give them a, a two or, or a one, and they think, well, then I don't have to give them such a, a percentage of bonus because they're, they're not uh, performing, they could be doing better. Well, yes, everybody could be doing better. And I think that's where the motivating, the cheerleading and, and those things come into place. But be fair, be consistent and do not think about money. Think about retention and think about your people and how you're making them feel um, and, and motivating them to stay in the positions that they're in. And then promote compensation, equity and transparency. I think we already talked about that. I should never have to have a talk where um, somebody that's just starting uh, with zero years of experience is making, you know, $10 more than somebody that's been there for 20 years. It's just, um, it, it shouldn't happen that way. Um, so in, in, enhance the leave policies and the flex schedules. Um, implement a world, implement an organization-wide mental health day. We have them, they're on the calendar. So, uh, and Carla sends emails out to tell you when those, when that mental health day is. But it's really important, um, I think, during that month, is it February? May. may okay may um in may i think especially you know um it's it's a month that's a month that can be hard it's exhausting you have all these graduations that are happening kids are out of school now you've got a lot to think about a mental health day is is huge so if you can fit it in um and even surprise someone we know you have a lot going on we have um we have somebody else coming in today to to cover your shift or tomorrow to cover your shift please go spend time with your kids those surprises mean the world to somebody you still give them um the the, the pay so you're not cutting their pay you're not charging them a pto day uh, but those people that have gone above and beyond and have picked up after extra shifts or whatever they're doing they need a mental health day and they need to know that you appreciate them um, implementing flexible schedules and four day work weeks. That's huge. Um, um, a lot of times when I was a nursing home administrator, I would choose, I didn't choose, I would just ask anybody interested in helping with the schedules um, per shift, whatever the shift was. And the, yeah, they made their own shifts. They, they took off their own days that they wanted to work. They worked with their team members. Um, we didn't have to really get involved that much. We set the ground rules and they, they had a flexible schedule at that point. And I think really good, strong teamwork with their team as well. Um, encourage employee resistance and offer the mental health education and resilience, I'm sorry. <laughs> Persistent and um, I organize the small group wellness coaching and and services. I will tell you the EAP group that I used when I could see the frustration or just an overwhelming amount of of stress going on within our team, um, or if we brought on a new key team member or um, like a you know a new shift almost so when we had uh, when we built new buildings uh, with new teams. EAP does these personality um, tests or, or questionnaires. They know how you're going to respond if you're type A, type B, e, whatever, or if your color, green, red, blue, whatever the color scheme is. They're going to tell you, you scored a certain way and this is how you're responding. But it's more for your team members as well to understand who you are and why you um, respond that way as well. And then people can understand they feel this way, so I'm not going to react this way. You know, some people you can be really bold with. You can just say, you don't have to sugarcoat anything. They don't want sugarcoating. Um, then, then that's how you, you just have to give it straight to them. People that need a little bit more finessing, you're going to know who those people are as well. So this is really great for leadership, but it's really great for um, your team builds um, as well. I, I highly recommend it. 
um, mental health awareness, monthly activities, and provide resources. We'll talk more about the resources at the end. Um, also, balance, balance approach to scheduled meetings. Instead of a 60-minute meeting and going over, um, mm -hmm. how about we do a 45-minute 45 45-minute meeting and um, we we um, take take our time, but meet that agenda. And then you know what? Hit the big stuff first. The absolutes that you need to hit for that 45 minutes. The others you might need to triage to the next uh, the next meeting. So implement no meeting Wednesdays. And I'm even talking about like stand up meetings in the mornings if you can help it. Um, it's really great if you just get a go in your office and and start working. Uh, you, you don't have to have the meeting to tell everybody what you're doing. Um, you know, you guys are all team members and you can still communicate. Nobody's saying cut off communication throughout the day. They're just saying, you know, hit the floor running the way that you need to. Um, circulate the work preferences surveys. And this is also going back to that autonomy and, and delegating those tasks um, and asking people, okay, I really don't enjoy doing scheduling, but sounds like you really do. Maybe you do that and then I'll take on a different task. So figure out what their preferences are so they are excited about coming to work as well. Um, and when we talk about meetings as well, what I will say is there is one thing that I did was uh, team talk at uh, the beginning of every shift and, and it, it was from shift to shift. So first shift, second shift, they would talk not, not just about shift change, but it was probably, it was more of a mission, vision, value focus for that week. And we did a little something special each, each day um, to, to remind them of why we're here, what the purpose is. Uh, and give them a little time to hear, you know, so that we can hear them as well. What's going on? What's a red flag right now? What's a hot topic? What's causing issues? And we can put those fires out real very quickly because they know that they've been heard and there's probably an easy, easy solution out there. They, we just, somebody needs to say it. So instead of waiting for them to come to you, it's really important to, to go to them and, and be interactive with the team. Don't hide in the office. Um, encourage connection. So host connection meetings, um, having virtual happy hours. We do this. We uh, with Huntingdon, we are throughout the entire state from Pensacola to the Keys, everywhere in between. And so we can't be everywhere at one time, uh, but we do host uh, connection meetings. And yes, it is a happy hour. <laughs> so um, it is, you know, we're all adults here. So every once in a while you can have a little fun. Um, but, you know, host the team meetings, make it relaxation, maybe bring in some um, chair massages um, or special recognition outings. This one of the special recognition outings, we would have our corporate team come in and they would do a, a barbecue. It might have been a special, like maybe they just a, success, a successful survey, an anniversary, um, those types of things. But the team would come in and they would celebrate and, and it was you know, usually the people that are in the suit and ties, they could have been in scrubs. They're they're getting their hands dirty. They're cooking for us. They're doing those things. Um, we've also had it where the outings um, is we might have a sister company or a sister facility down the road. That team we have arranged and we have them help come in, cover our shift, and we go and and go go bowling, or um, we go do what are those uh, when you like zip lining or horseback riding or like some kind of park. What is that called? I'm drawing a blank. But you go to those uh, team activities that you can build and build together, um, but it's a surprise. It's something that they can look forward to. They're still getting paid for the day, but it's getting away from everybody and focusing on the fun stuff, not, not just tasks all day long. Um, and then encourage that in-person call, colleague to colleague support um, that we talked a little bit about about a little bit ago. A lot of times you're going to find who your people are and it's nice if you can just give them a coffee break and say, hey, you guys have the next 30 minutes, go somewhere. Here's a, you know, here's a, a coffee card of, of the local coffee shop. Um, go take a minute and just just vent or, or whatever you need to do, come back happy and healthy. So Carla is here to talk mm -hmm. about the helpful resources. Sure. So basically what we want to do is we want to share some free resources for you. Let's say that after you heard all this and you, you're either wanting more information about burnout, wanting more information about how you can bring mental health awareness to your organization through all those strategies that Stephanie was discussing. So the World Health Organization, the WHO, actually has uh, whole programs where you can go a whole year and you can go week by week. You can download this information. I have a 
link there, and I'm sure Darlene can share this with the participants. You can click there and actually you can have a whole calendar of how to bring mental health awareness to your organization and address burnout. So that's really important. Also, we wanted to, um, I know that Stephanie was mentioning EAPs or the employee assistant programs. Sometimes we have people that might veer away from it. Oh, I don't want to be identified. I don't want, I don't want to, I don't want to click on that link. I don't want to go to that, that my employer is posting up. Well, I wanted to share the earn employer assistant resource network. This is free. And this is actually for me, uh, mental health friendly workplace. And what you do is you can also go to the empower work text line. Now, this is really cool. It's 510-674-1414. So if you text that line, actually you will get somebody on the other line responding, not a bot, but an actual human being that you can talk to if you're experiencing burnout at work. And also it doesn't have to be attached to your employer per se. So you can have all this information out there for people to reach out to and do this for free. It's particularly for uh, mental health workers and also workers that, that work in the healthcare community because we are a little bit more prone to burnout because of the the areas that we work in. And finally, I wanted to remind everybody that if somebody comes to you or if you see somebody that has some mental issues or maybe they're going through a crisis, we all have to remember this. We all have 911. We learned it when we were kids. Now we have 988. And that is the new number for the U.S. Suicide Helpline. It used to be a longer name, still works, 1-800-273-TALK. Now it's 988. It's going to connect you immediately to resources in your area. So if somebody, maybe a colleague or a coworker, or maybe somebody that you manage comes to you and needs help and you don't know like exactly where to send them, you can always tell them to go to 988. It's not only for people that are suicidal, it will connect you with clinical resources in your area and this works for the whole United States. So those are the free helpful resources we wanted to share, Darlene. We want to make sure that everybody has a chance to either look at it, write it down, or just receive these resources from you after uh, we finish. Thank you so much, everybody, for your attention, and we're open to any questions. Yeah, that's a lot of really great information. You know, one thing you were talking about is like stress and anxiety, how it can um, affect you. Um, it, it affects you in many different ways because stress has to get out, I feel like. Right. Um, I went through a very, very stressful period in my life and I lost massive amounts of hair. Um, I was, my hair had thinned, it was broken. It was, it was, I have tons now, but you would have not recognized me. It was just, it, it was incredible. My hairdresser, it was coming out. It was everywhere. It was, I would get out of the car and if I was wearing black, I, you would just could literally pick it up and just throw it out. Like it was extra garbage. It, it was insane and it was a hundred percent stress related. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a book out there. It's called the body keeps the score. The body will keep, it's actually based on PTSD and trauma, which also affects the body in many, many ways, but definitely stress, something we all experience from time to time. And if we don't pay too much attention to it, it builds up. It will definitely take a toll on your body and you will start developing some conditions. So we definitely want to be on top of that because yeah. stress, and uncontrolled stress will be the whole hallmark into what might turn into a state of burnout. So we wanna make sure we stay alert. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the questions we had is, can you discuss how to prevent organizational burnout slide again? I went by too fast. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, so let's, let's try, that's true. We do have it over here. We're gonna have to go. And keep in mind, we're going to share the there link to this entire presentation afterwards. So everyone will be getting this. Oh, that's so nice. I'm, I'm glad people are going to get this. Absolutely. Yes. And I'm glad that people are so interested in the topic. This has been wonderful participation. And thank you for the question. So, Stephanie, you were you were discussing this. Sorry, I went so fast. But what yeah. I will say while we're back on this slide is um, on the goals section, so setting clear and consistent goals for the team so they, they know what they are. You know, and it, I, I think the goals, it's important to know where do you want to, where, what discussion do you want to have? Because if you're having a, a really bad day or a stress, stressful time with your team, I don't think it's time to talk about your yearly goals or even maybe your monthly sales goals or whatever's going on. It's time to talk about those daily goals, your purpose, what you're doing for the day, um, getting them back on track with those to-do lists, those action items. 
Um, while I'm mentioning it, um, Carla and I have done a presentation on how to set personal goals as well. Um, uh, it can be personal or, or organizational, but we do have a presentation about that if anybody would ever uh, have some interest. Um, training, um, you know, I think you have to kind of continue to identify, of course, you're going to have your trainings of when somebody joins your team. Um, and so, and then you also have consistent trainings um, and to also increase the, the role effectiveness, that conflict resolution, the coping me mechanisms. I think that all comes with training when somebody joins the team and you're setting kind of the, the platform of what your culture is. So that training is not just about task oriented training and kind of your skill set and knowledge that you need, but I think it's the training of, of them learning what your organization um, is about and also your team members in that. Yeah, and being mindful of emotions, for example, because we all are, are here to do a job and we focus on the task, but we have to know that we're coming in as complete human beings into an environment. So we all have an impact on each other and also being emotionally uh, very acute and uh, emotional intelligence is something that we need to teach for, uh, to our employees, to the members of the organization, because it's gonna help us. It's just like it's, it helps our children when they're in school to be emotionally aware, it also works the same way in, the, in, in their workplace. But I will also say um, with the training is, uh, I think the more consistent training we can do, I think when we start um, as a provider out in the field, um, they get 12 weeks of uh, what we call coaching, but it's kind of that ramp up period. Um, it's talking about heavy caseload. So we have specific coaches that have been uh, very, very uh, well received out in the communities um, that we serve, and they've done a great job um, representing Huntingdon. And so now they are coaches. So there's other ways to motivate people when they start the process of joining the team of, look, there's there's more levels that you can get to as well, and we want you to, to be um, successful. So the consultations uh, provide work-focused consultations to staff who are experiencing job stress. So I think this is, you know, what we're talking about, um, the job analysis, for example, right? Mm -hmm. When you when somebody might need to come and talk to their boss and say, okay, I, I don't feel like I have I have too much on my plate. I need more control over what I'm doing. Maybe you as, as a supervisor identify somebody that's having some of those uh, presentations that might look like uh, burnout. Maybe it's time to have a chat and it's time to see how, how can you, can, how can we take this job stress and work with it so that you don't become um, completely burdened by the by it and develop burnout. Right. Same thing with support. Yep. So. Same thing. Yeah, this all kind of ties hand in hand. So encouraging the development of support groups and resource exchange networks. So once again, you're talking um, about there's different groups out there, you guys, uh, depending on on what your focus is. There's usually something um, where you look on on your social media uh, pages, that type of stuff, but you're probably going to find a support group. Um, a lot of times it, you you can find other people to network within your local or chapter organizations of whatever you're, you're um, associating with as well. So there's definitely, and then, I mean, FSLA there, you know, if you're like, I have this passion and this is what I want to get into, I'm sure they have some resources for you um, for networking events as well. They do a great job, obviously. Look, we've got almost every state, all right, mm -hmm. here, here today. Um, and then also that empower maximizing staff Staff economy and participation in decision making. You're you're so fading a, in and out of oh. again, Stephanie. Sorry. Sorry, it's just yeah. So maximizing that staff staff autonomy and participation in decision making. Let's go back to those team talks um, where the group can get together. They've been heard. Then you know they have solutions to the problems. Um, you know they have. They're the ones usually that are day in day out. They know where they're dissatisfied. They know where they're extremely satisfied, and they talk amongst each other, right? They know what the solutions are. You just have to open up the door so that um, that they know that you want to hear them um, and that you genuinely care about them wanting to be a part of your organization. Does so, that help? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think she wanted to see the slide again. So I think that's okay. good. So the other question that we have is, um, what are your thoughts on how to manage staff shortage related burnout? Staff shortage related burnout. Um, you know, I. This is something that has been here pre pandemic and um, post pandemic, and it's never going to go away. Um, so 
one is to celebrate what you can celebrate and acknowledge one another and try to keep keep your mindset as positive as possible and, and talking about the resources that we've already um, provided for you guys to to access the other uh, so mindset is it's mind over matter sometimes that's that's a big one um and and when you start your day you know um as a nursing home administrator if i knew they were going to be short on a on a night shift i was there on their night shift we were starting with pizza we were starting with the to-do list what are the tasks that i can help with um you know what's the routine and fill in where you can you can't do that every day but it's appreciated when you can when you're leading a team i also think that um and pizza doesn't fix anything but um hungry people get hangry people. So, um, yeah, I think anytime you're expecting extra from your staff that you normally wouldn't, regardless of what the situation is, even of a staff shortage, yeah. any little extra thing that you do that's out of the ordinary makes them feel appreciated and they're willing to take up that extra slack at some point. Absolutely. Yeah. It's yeah. just showing that it, it's just showing that appreciation, doing the going that extra mile for sure. So we did have another question and I'm I don't really understand the question, so I'm just gonna read it. Um, it um Thren says, of course, this is interesting. Stress and burnout is prevalent these days, almost for pervasive. How do we deal with that level? Yeah, this one, Carla. So I don't really understand the question. So am I, am I missing it? Can you read it again, Darlene, please? Yes. Um, of course, this is interesting. Stress and burnout is prevalent these days, almost pervasive. How do we deal with that level? So I think maybe it just needs to be reworded. Okay. Well, if, if we're talking about when somebody gets to the point of burnout, where we okay. are at that level that, uh, you know, it's, it's serious. Definitely, if we are in charge or, or managing or supervising that individual and they do not have insight into how they're behaving, maybe they look like they don't look like themselves, that's what we should do, that consultation and, and maybe go behind closed doors for a little bit and open up the discussion. Why? Because sometimes we feel that if we let anybody know in our place of work that, that we are experiencing burnout, it might work against us. But actually, it's, it's good to show that vulnerability and then have some resources be allocated for you. Because if you talk to your boss and say, hey, you know, I've been here 20 years and I'm starting to feel the weight of it, maybe it's time we have a conversation about how we can better fix it. Obviously, uh, employee assistant programs are always a good choice for leaders to have those referrals ready for people uh, that might need it. And also offer them to actually work flexible, some flexibility into their caseload, into their uh, their shifts, just like Stephanie was mentioning. When we have somebody experiencing burnout, it is severe. Maybe they do need more than one mental health day, right? Yeah. Maybe they need to talk to HR. Maybe they need some time off. Maybe we need to be flexible for a little bit and um, and actually take it seriously. If we are in conversation with somebody experiencing burnout, I would personally ask them if they feel like they're depressed and if they feel suicidal or if they feel like they, they're they just like not in control anymore so that we can refer them to a professional. Because definitely yeah. it does feel just like major depressive disorder and it can be that serious. Like I mentioned earlier, we did have people um, and we do have people in, in the profession and the mental health profession and medical professions that have committed suicide. And oh, they were 100%. working, they were working up until that day, they were working up until that moment. And that is because there was this burnout just in the background that maybe it's the elephant in the room. And it's not normal to just experience it and keep on going. Uh, we, we have to help each other. Right, right. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, ladies. I know that if anyone has any more additional questions or comments, you're welcome to reach out to either one of these ladies or, um, uh, I'll give you an email that you can connect with, um, but we are after the three o'clock hour. I like to be cognizant of everyone's time um, and be off, uh, you know, end our, end our webinar um, in a timely manner. So I want to thank you for joining us today. Um, hopefully this webinar um, was really helpful to you and to your team. Um, please be on the lookout. You will be receiving an email with a link to the presentation afterwards. Um, and additional information. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Carla and Stephanie with Huntington Behavioral Health.
Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. And those are our emails if you want to reach out to us directly. Thank you so much, Darlene. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. I'll leave that on the screen for a minute so people can grab it. All right. Thank you, everyone.